Ella P. Stewart is remembered by your generation as the namesake of this school on Avondale Avenue. But your great grandparents' generation remembered her from a very different place not so far away. Right over here at the corner of Indiana and City Park. 50 years ago, right here was the site of Stewart's Pharmacy. Ella P. Stewart owned and operated this place. She was one of the first licensed African-American women as a pharmacist in the entire United States. And her store was more than a place where you got your prescription filled. This place right here was the heart and soul of the Pinewood Door neighborhood. From the 1920s, the Door Street Corridor, the Pinewood neighborhood, was Toledo's most storied African-American neighborhood. Today, we're gonna to talk about the Great Migration, which brought so many African-American families to Toledo and made our city a better place. That store was the heart of the neighborhood, but that store wasn't the story of the whole neighborhood. We're gonna to try to delve in today to the beginnings of Black Toledo. So, in the early years, there were, there were Black people in Toledo from the very beginning. Um, back to the 1850s. And the black population of the city kind of hovered between 1% and 2% of the total population uh, until the 1920s, at which point the African-American population of the city triples basically overnight. In a 10-year period, the population triples. And our question has to be, what happened? What happened to triple the population in that short a period of time? Well, you kind of get to pick your ism in this case. Um, after World War I, uh, in which communism played a big part and people were really worried about the spread of communism in uh, Ru in Russia, Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. Um, American nativists uh, who believed in nativism, which is uh, basically a, a form of racism against anybody who's uh, an immigrant. Um, nativists basically got a package of laws passed to completely shut down American immigration by 1925. The problem was factories in the North still needed a lot of new workers and they needed cheap labor. And they had been getting this cheap labor from a lot of Southern and Eastern European countries like Poland and Hungary, and Czechoslovakia and Italy and Greece. And now all that, that supply of labor is gone. So factory owners in the North start looking South. They start recruiting black sharecroppers to come up to the North. And this table that you see in this slide uh, is from uh, an article written by Dr. Lee Williams uh, back in the 1980s. And, and uh, Williams has written two of the best pieces on Black Toledo that exist. Um, and in that table, you can see the explosion of the population, where in 1850, there are about 118 African-American people in town. Ten years later, 229. Ten years after that, 600. Ten years after that, 900. Then 1,000. 1,700. 1800 and then boom 5700 13000 this is a real population explosion and as you look at percentage of population from 1 to 2 to 4 in 20 years that's a big explosion in population now why did black workers agree to come here because this is a two way street this is not slavery this is not being told you have to go to a place why did black workers decide to leave the south well Typically, anytime we look at migration in the world, we look at things called push factors and pull factors. Push factors being the things that stink in your homeland that make you want to move. Pull factors being the things that are at least marginally better in the place you're going that are the reason you go. And again, we, we, I think we've talked about this before in this class. These are things that exist for us today. Uh, you know, your cousin moves to Atlanta to get a job. They got pushed out of Toledo because there weren't any jobs in their field, pulled to Atlanta because there were better jobs. Um, Things get rough in Toledo. You've got some beef with people and you move somewhere else. That's the same stuff as back then. Um, so when we look at the Great Migration, what were the push factors in the South in the 1920s? Well, you had the rise of the Ku Klux Klan again. That's a, that's a push factor to make you leave. You had um, uh, job shortages down in the South. There basically are no jobs because the South has no industry still by the 1920s. Um, people are sharecropping, they're destitute. These are bad things, people are leaving. There's a massive flood in 1927 that's gonna push even more people out. Um, and in the North, what do you have? Well, you've still got racism, but it's a different kind of racism than the South. Um, you've got more jobs for sure, and jobs that pay better, and opportunity to own your own home. Those are things that didn't exist in the South for many people. So there are pull factors bringing people North for sure that are better than the things that were happening in the South. 
Pioneer neighborhoods for Toledo's black community. Um, we typically look at three neighborhoods. One of them was near downtown, uh, near historic St. Patrick's Church. Um, basically, there was there was a street that used to be called John R. Street that came down there uh, towards Avondale. And John R. and Avondale was kind of a hub of African-American activity in the late 1800s. Um, that starts moving out west on Avondale, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Another one of the historic black neighborhoods going all the way back to the 1800s is Ironwood, um, which is on the east side over near Oakdale and the New York Central Railroad tracks. Um, another one was out Stickney, uh, and this would be like Stickney between Sherman and Central, south of Woodward High School, uh, before you get down to uh, the old Forest Cemetery. It was, again, one of these neighborhoods that had a significant black population prior to 1900. And then the other one that becomes really the most important uh, is the old Lanks Hill. We've talked about Lanks Hill a few times. Lanks Hill was this German neighborhood from the 1840s. Uh, then Polish people start moving in real close to Lanks Hill. And by the time we get to the 1910s, and you're going to see something pretty cool on this in a separate slideshow, um, by the time we get to the 1910s, uh, Lanks Hill changes fast into what becomes known as the Pinewood District. Or that's what uh, Dr. Williams, who I'll cite a million times during this, uh, Dr. Williams called it the Pinewood District all the time. So ownership in the neighborhood becomes a really big deal, and especially in Toledo, Ohio. This is one of the things that makes Toledo's black community very different from black communities in other cities in Ohio and other cities in the Midwest. Um, Dr. Williams wrote, quote, behind the walls of primarily all black neighborhoods, residents fashioned their world. That yes, these were segregated areas, but in those segregated areas, uh, black people had an autonomy, uh, both in their political and religious and economic uh, worlds, that they were able to create something new and exciting and, and great. So one of the things that I think is really interesting, and again, this is Dr. Dr. Lee Williams, who wrote his dissertation, his doctoral dissertation, was on Black Toledo from the 1850s to the 1930s, and you can read it down at the main library. It's a, a really good read, um, and somebody needs to update it soon. Um, Williams looked at homeownership rates among the Poles, the Hungarians, the Czechs in Toledo, and found that in the early 20s and 30s, black homeownership outstripped the ethnic whites. That What that means, more black people owned their homes than white people owned their homes in the city of Toledo. Most of the ethnic whites who were moving in were renting exclusively and didn't own their homes. And that's something that's very different in Toledo's black community than in other black communities. Another thing about that that's really important, it's not just about owning your own home. For a lot of these people, lots of these people, 70% of black homeowners, it also meant there was a source of income. It didn't mean it was a bill paying for the house. It meant there was income because most black families rented out rooms in their house to other black people. And that creates an economy, right? Now everybody, 70% of these homeowners have income coming in. And that's a big deal. Whether they're working or not, they've got income from rent. Um, and, and that's going to help. Number one, it, it helps keep money in the black community, right? Instead of money going to white landlords, it's staying in the black community. And that's a, that's a really big deal. Um, Williams also wrote uh, that segregation existed in Toledo from the beginning. That Each of those neighborhoods we talked about from Ironwood and out Stickney, John R. and the Pinewood District, segregation had existed there from the beginning. Um, but then it gets reinforced and it gets reinforced in the 1930s by a process called redlining. Um, Redlining starts during the Great Depression uh, with something called the Homeownership Loan Company. And the Homeownership Loan Company basically tells banks where they can make loans. These were formal bank and governmental policies that restricted what parts of a city African Americans could live in and purchase homes and purchase land. What it did was concentrate people into select neighborhoods. So as you can see in the background here, and we'll look at this map in greater detail in a minute, now, it's literally red lined, right? These are red areas of town that were said to have substandard housing, and that's where they made loans to, to black families. Those areas didn't change. They basically made this map and the map stayed the same. So what it meant over time, as more and more, you guys saw the numbers of black Americans moving into the city by the thousands, there are less places for them to go. So what this is gonna mean is massive overcrowding. Which again, we're going to talk about in a separate movie. 
Um, but what it also does is create markets for black owned businesses and it fuels the rise of the black middle class in Toledo. And this is again, a really big deal when money is being spent almost exclusively in the community. It means the community is going to grow stronger. The community is going to grow, um, more, uh, I don't want to say wealthy, but it, it's going to grow in a way that the money is staying there. And that's a really good thing and a really big deal. Here's another look at that map. So if you look at these red line districts with me, right over here is that Ironwood neighborhood on the east side. So here's where the railroad track come through and like the viaduct on East Broadway. This is just past that. And then you have another red line neighborhood. Uh, basically following Miami Street to the bend in the river. So like Miami Street between, uh, I don't know, Oakdale and uh, and maybe Facet Street, because the, I think Facet is right about here. It was the Facet Street Bridge. Um, here's that Pinewood neighborhood. Uh, the Pinewood neighborhood, which is like Avondale, Indiana, Nebraska, City Park, Hamilton, uh, Pinewood Avenue, obviously, uh, all that. Then you have just north of downtown. Uh, and this is like Warren Sherman area. Then you've got out here is that um, out Stickney neighborhood. And then in very, very North Toledo. So this is out like uh, Manhattan Boulevard and Summit Street. Uh, you had another uh, neighborhood that was redlined for uh, African-Americans. Uh, and then just south of Calvary Cemetery, south of the UT campus, uh, Parkside Boulevard right here was another redlined neighborhood. Uh, and these these were the hearts of early black Toledo. All right. Now, of all of those, by far the most important neighborhood is Pinewood, um, which some people call the Door Street Corridor today. Um, why is Pinewood available? Well, first of all, German and Polish families that had lived in Lanks Hill and then the very east end of Kuschwanz, they had started moving west. And one of the funny ways that you can kind of track um, Polish migration in Toledo is by the start dates of the Catholic churches along Nebraska Avenue, and then look as they move farther west. So you start out with like St. Anthony's and then you got Nativity and then it moves, you know, further and further down to St. Hyacinth. And then, um, um, finally, uh, way out hill towards, uh, Our Lady of Lourdes, uh, which was a, a Polish outpost church, uh, by the 1920s. So, when these German and Polish families are moving from like City Park in Nebraska, they're moving to Parkside. They're moving to Evesham. They're moving way out hill towards Holland, Sylvania. And as white families moved out, black families, again, quote from Dr. Williams, uh, got their chance at more substantial housing in the Pinewood district. So instead of having just a few housing options, now some really decent housing options are opening up in the Pinewood district for black families. Um, anchors of the black community in Toledo, uh, from the beginning were churches. Um, the oldest, uh, black church in Toledo is Warren AME and Warren AME, of course, today is off Collingwood. Uh, it started downtown, uh, by where the HCR Manor Care building is, was the original Warren AME church. The black churches kind of multiplied, uh, throughout the black neighborhoods in Toledo and they provided a backbone. Uh, for the black economy and black resistance. One of the things to keep in mind, black churches were one of the few institutions completely controlled by black people. Uh, they controlled who the minister was. They controlled the economy of the church, the building of the church. This, this was really, really important to have one institution that was really, um, part of the community and heart of the community. And so churches throughout the tens, twenties, thirties uh, are the beginnings of boycotts. They're going to cooperatively organize. All the churches will agree. Nobody's shopping at this place until they change their policy and how they treat black people walking in. And this was a source of real power for the black community in the early days. Um, two other places that were just critically important institutions in the black community in, in the early days, um, were the Frederick Douglass center in the Indiana Avenue. Y. now today you guys uh, know where the Frederick Douglass center is out there. Um, it's kind of a mock, well, modern in air quotes, seventies, uh, style building. And then this building you recognize, uh, because it's a shelter today. Uh, but the shelter used to be the Indiana Avenue YMCA. These two places were founded by two of the Titans of uh, Black Toledo, Albertus Brown and Reverend Lee McWilliams. Um, 
Albertus Brown founded both the local chapter of the NAACP and the Frederick Douglass Center. And the Frederick Douglass Center uh, was seen as a hub of the community for adult education, uh, teaching people trades. They had concerts. They had guest speakers. It was a meeting place. They had a gym. Uh, basketball teams and that kind of thing. Uh, they brought in speakers from the National Urban League. They brought in national speakers from Black America to talk to Black Toledoans about how to organize, how to improve uh, their lives, and how to, how to fight for their rights. Um, Lee McWilliams goes for a much bigger idea, which is saying that the YMCA, a Christian organization in Toledo, ought to admit Black people, which they hadn't done. Again, there's a ton of irony in that statement with a Christian organization being segregated. Um, but Reverend McWilliams leads this drive. He gets the backing of the newspaper and they build this incredible, it, to this day, it is an incredible building uh, at Indiana Avenue. Um, and the Indiana Avenue Y had a pool, had tennis courts, had basketball, had classrooms, meeting rooms, everything. Both of these places competed with each other. Uh, the Frederick Douglass Center teams against the YMCA teams. Um, but they both served residents of all ages and strengthened the black community through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Another thing we should talk about is an area called Black Downtown, which was along Door Street. And this is why some people sometimes call it the Door Street Corridor. By the time you get to the 1940s, there is a nine-block stretch of Door Street, uh, basically Collingwood back to the viaduct, um, near Detroit Avenue. In that nine block stretch of Door Street, you had 71 black owned businesses. It was the largest concentration of black owned businesses in the state of Ohio. Um, among some of the stores that people remember from down there, Harry's Men's and Boy Wear, Boys Wear, uh, the Hobbs Service Station, which was a full service mechanic shop and gas station, the World Theater, which was the only black owned theater in the city at that time. But most important of all the businesses down in this area, and just a couple blocks away, it was never on Door Street, was Stewart's Pharmacy. And most of you have heard of Ella P. Stewart by this time. And primarily, if you've heard of her, it's because of the elementary school that is named after her. Stewart's Pharmacy was important in a far different way than any of the other Black-owned businesses in Toledo, from the stuff that I've read. Um, Stewart's Pharmacy, as a pharmacy, it had pharmacists, obviously. It had a college-educated staff. It was staffed by college-educated people. And so Stewart's Pharmacy kind of became an intellectual center. So if you were a young person in the neighborhood and you were thinking about going to college, you went to LAP and Doc for their take on it, their advice, their shaping, okay? They were the people you trusted to give you the honest feedback on, if I'm going to go to college, where should I go to college? What should I pursue in college? What kind of opportunities are there? Where should I go after that? What should I do with my degree? Um, Ella P. Stewart and Doc Stewart became like really the most important sounding boards for the intellectual community uh, that lived in the Pinewood District. Um, we'll get to this later, but Ella P. and Doc are both going to be uh, not just leaders in the community, but leaders on planet Earth um, well past this, this period of the great, great Migration that we're talking about right now. So with that, we'll end the lesson. We'll come back to the Stewarts, and we'll sure come back to Pinewood and Door Street over the years. But I wanted to give you guys an idea of how this neighborhood was shaped. Uh, and in our next episode, you're going to learn about one person from that neighborhood. As always, thanks for your time, and be well.